seated. And uh, thank you so much again for being here together to worship our God, uh, to sing songs together, and to be able to hear His Word preached. Uh, let's be turning our Bibles to Mark chapter 1. And we'll get into it this morning. Uh, again, I'm encouraged that uh, we're able to have Frank with us once again. Uh, Frank and I go way back about 20 years together. Uh, being able to uh, be friends, uh, to be able to have been in the same church. And so, bro, I'm grateful that you're with us today, that uh, you know we're able to you know come to you uh, because many times you, you came to me in the past. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, uh, we're going to start off in verse 16 here. And the Bible says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. The title of the sermon this morning is Come, Follow Me. Come on, bro. Uh, you see, this wasn't some willy-nilly thing. This wasn't just a bunch of fishermen seeing this random guy and say, Hey, why don't you guys come follow me? Come on. Uh, by this time, Jesus had begun to preach. Yeah. He had already been healing. He had been baptized by John the Baptist, who had proclaimed that this is the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. So we know from the, the book of John that uh, Peter, Simon, uh, and Andrew already knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Yes. And so when Jesus came to call them, they already knew he was the Son of God. And so I'm, I can picture Simon and Andrew being like, you know what, Jesus, that's a great idea. I am sick and tired of smelling like fish all the time. I want the good stuff. We're going to follow you. We're going to... Follow you to greatness, to follow you to heaven. And Jesus is like, amen. Uh, bro, I'd hug you, but like you said, you smell like fish. <laughs> uh, turn over to Romans chapter 5. But it's so interesting of the state that we're all in when Jesus calls us. These men here, the state they were in is they were stinky. Uh, they were just kind of building their own kingdoms, their own lives, their own businesses. And Jesus says, come and follow me. Okay. And we pick up in Romans chapter 5, and verse 6. And the Bible says, you see at just the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. See, when Christ calls us, when God calls us, each one of us, we're dead in our sins. Yeah. God doesn't usually call the people who think they have it all together, who have these perfect lives that, you know, nothing's wrong with my life. My life is awesome yeah. because they're not ready. They're not ready to realize their need for God. And so often when he calls us like he did with me, he calls us when we're stinky in our own sin. Yes. Amen. When we're just dead in our own trans transgressions. Yes. Uh, I remember it pretty well myself. Uh, I was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I just really desired to reconnect with God. I had grown up going to church all my life. And after high school, I started traveling around with the job that I had and, and going from place to place. And with that comes just the inability to really connect with any church. Uh, and then with that, you know, uh, comes a life of basically doing whatever you want. Wow. And the crowd of guys that I surrounded myself with uh, really uh, affected my character. I started giving in to the world, wow. started giving in to my desires of my flesh. And I'm like, I got I to gotta move somewhere to one spot where I can really start going to church and reignite my relationship with God. And so I had a friend from high school that lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He had started going to school down there. And he's like, why don't you come? We'll get an apartment together. Great idea. 
So I moved down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and, and we got an apartment together, and like two months, three months had gone by, and nothing really changed. Amen. I was in one spot like I had asked for, yeah. yet I didn't start turning back to God. Living the same life, partying, uh, you know, women, uh, drinking, and I went out to the beach one night, I remember very clearly, and I was just crying at the state of my life, wow. crying out to God. Asking God for forgiveness and to point me in the direction he wanted me to go. That was going to be the church that really brought me closer to him. Amen. And I had a friend that, uh, you know, I, I'd gone to the next day, literally. And she's like, I literally just got baptized in this church. You got to come check it out. And so I went out to their midweek service. I met a, a group of righteous, spiritual men who said, let's study the Bible. All right. Let's wow. figure out what God intends for your life. And I studied the Bible and got baptized as a real, true Christian, a real disciple at that point in my life. Uh, you know, it was incredible. My, my life was a mess. I realized it. I knew I needed God. I knew I needed Him in my life. And then when I was ready, God called me out of my stinky state of life. You see, just like Peter who said, you know what, this sounds good to me. Bring on the peace and happiness. Bring on the good stuff, God. I wanted to follow Jesus straight to heaven. Wow. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 16. Right. And we understand that uh, when Jesus calls us, we're all looking for the same thing, are we not? Yeah. Oh God, just uh, let's, you know, give me to heaven. Give me that life of peace. Give me that life of tranquility. And then Jesus gives his disciples a little more direction on what he expects of them as they follow him. Right. In verse 21 of Matthew 16, the Bible says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but the concerns of man. Point number one this morning is follow Jesus in his suffering. You see, Peter didn't like this. Uh, you, you can sort of get an idea of where you are spiritually when you start to rebuke Jesus. Uh, you know, Jesus, I don't like what you're doing here. This is not a good idea. I think it would be better if we did it this way. And we pull Jesus aside and have a little conversation. But he didn't like it. Jesus, you remember when you just called us to follow you? If you go to suffer many things, if you're going to be put to death and we're following you, then the same expectation is for us as well. I don't know if I like that, Jesus. I wanted the comfortable life, remember? We were fishermen, and then we decided to follow you so we can be comfortable, right? We can have the good things in life. You see, I think as Americans, we're in the same place. Uh, we don't like suffering. Uh, let's crank up the AC, guys. If, you, if you're on the cold nature, let's crank up the heat, right? Uh, you know, where's the Wi-Fi? I gotta have Wi-Fi everywhere I go. I gotta stay connected. What am I gonna do without Wi-Fi? We wanna shop online because who wants to walk through stores anymore? My wife does. I, don't, I haven't figured it out. She likes to walk around through the stores even though we don't have any money. And look at the things. Uh, but I don't want any part of it. Just let me click a button and have them send it to my house. Uh, but we like it nice and simple and comfortable. Uh, you know, it's ironic. Uh, my wife and I moved to Boston a few years ago, and then we uh, had the opportunity to live in Brooklyn, New York, uh, for a year. And uh, they don't really believe in air conditioning up there. They do, but not, not many houses have it. And so I'm like, okay, I guess it's cold up here, so they don't need it. I'll go with that. Uh, I was looking for a place with AC because that's what I'm used to in here. 
So literally, we rolled up there at the end of May, and then so we get into June, July, and I'm like, it's hot. <laughs> it, it's literally just as hot and humid up north as it is down here. I, th- I was crazy. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't live it out myself. The only difference is it's very short-lived. Three weeks, maybe a month. Uh, whereas here it's like 11 months. Right? <laughs> 11 and a half months. Yeah. Hot and humid. Yeah. Uh, and so we like our AC down here. But, uh, you know, I was miserable. I was like, it's so hot. Uh, and I had to endure a little suffering for the gospel there. Uh, you know, it's incredible because... As disciples, sometimes we just want the good stuff. Yes. You know, Jesus, give me the love. Give me the family and the friends. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. Happiness. Uh, you know, this whole self-denial thing, uh, I don't know about that. Right. You want me to surrender? <laughs> I thought I was going to be in control of this thing. Yeah. Wow. The direction of my life, where I want to go, who I want to date, who I want to marry. Isn't it up to me? What is this considering other people's greater than myself? Yeah. I'm not so sure I want that suffering. Yeah. You know what? I'm just going to take it out of my Bible. I'm going to rip it out. Uh, no, nah, I'll just pretend it's not there. Yeah. I'll, I'll take the parts of the Bible that I want to apply to my life. The rest of it, you know, doesn't really apply to us these days. I mean, you know, it was a book written a long, long time ago. Can it really apply to our lives today? Come on, bro. And again, we just want the good stuff. Yeah. We want the good, not the bad. Yeah. You know, Isaiah 53 defines Jesus as a man of suffering, a man of sorrows. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter 5, we get another peek at Jesus' life. And why he chose suffering. Why? why? God, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you let Jesus just come down and have a good life? And he could just call people to himself and it'd be nice and comfortable. Everybody would come if it was comfortable. Amen. We just have tons of people filling the aisles because it's comfy. It's nice. And in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. We see that in Jesus' life, it says, During the days of His life on earth, He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save Him from death. And He was heard because of His reverent submission. Son, Son of God, though He was, He learned obedience from what He suffered. And once made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey Him. You see, Jesus learned his obedience to the Father through what he suffered. Some of us disciples decide that we want to follow Jesus and we're surprised that we need to suffer. That there's things in life that that we need to just kind of bear through and grow in our obedience to God. You see, if you never had to choose between giving your contribution to God and eating out that week, giving to God or perhaps paying your rent on time, then you never had to suffer and learn what it means to be obedient to God, regardless of your circumstance. See, the world will tell you, that's crazy. You got to pay your bills first. You got to fill your stomach before you do anything else. Cut out that contribution thing because how does that really apply to you anyways? What does that do for you? But we know that God calls us to give to Him. First, You see, God introduces challenges. He introduces trials into our lives so that we can be trained to be obedient to Him. I believe that there's three areas in our, in our life, or three areas in Jesus' life that He suffered and endured suffering that we need to learn to embrace in our own lives. Number one is family opposition. Family opposition. Turn to Mark chapter 3. There was a time in Jesus' life where his family, seeing the way he was preaching the word, seeing how uh, he constantly had uh, conflict with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they came to him because they thought he was out of his mind. What in the world is he doing? Let's go grab our brother. Let's go grab my son, Jesus, 
and take charge of him. And Mark chapter 3 and verse 20, we pick up and it says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered. And that's a good point right there. Where are your crowds? Who are the people that know your life and want to follow you because you're following Jesus? Because you're living out the scriptures in your life. Jesus and his disciples always had a crowd that gathered, that followed, because they knew that he was of God. It said a crowd had gathered so they, that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they, they came to take charge of him and said, He is out of his mind. Skip down to verse 32. It says a crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, These are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. See, Jesus' family thought he was crazy and out of his mind. And they thought, we need to stop him. You know, there's been stories where some parents, uh, they realize that their, their, uh, their son or daughter has gone off to college. And now they've become part of an incredible church. And they're like, this church is taking too much time away from of school. <coughs> too much time away from your studies. Yeah. You need to put school before God. Wow. When the child realizes, no, what's more important is that I put God as first wow. in my life. Wow. There's been stories where parents have literally said, you know, college is supposed to be a time to have fun. To experience new things. To be a little wild and crazy. Why are you spent wasting this time going to church? You have plenty of time later in life to do that. Spread your oats. Have fun. Get out there and experience life. But the college student says, no. God is number one in my life. You know, uh, many of you may have heard. Uh, you know, these are small things that we deal with in, in the U.S., a uh, small little, uh, uh, you know, family opposition. Uh, this is a sister in uh, our sister church in Chennai, India. She now actually uh, went to plant the church last year in New Delhi, India. Uh, but she comes from a Muslim background. And uh, she was studying the Bible and decided, I'm going to become a Christian. And so part of their accounting the cost to become a Christian over there is they need to tell their family. Especially if they come from a Muslim or Hindu background. Because there's a lot of family opposition over there. And that's part of really deciding to become a follower of Jesus. Yeah. And so she went and told her, told her family, I'm, I've made the decision to change my life and become a Christian, become a disciple of Jesus. Wow. And her father literally took a knife and held it to her throat and said, I will kill you before you make that mistake. Yeah. Thank God that he didn't and that uh, uh, her life was spared by God. That she remained faithful. That she persevered and prayed for her family every day. And now today her father prays himself to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got to persevere with our families, guys. Uh, we have to endure family opposition because God wants to save our families as well. Uh, number two, let's turn to Mark chapter 14. I think the second area that Jesus needed to endure is through character assassination. What in the world is that? You see, character assassination is when people start talking bad about you, or they maybe spread lies or half-truths so that people will turn against you and not accept the word of God. In Mark chapter 14, we'll pick up in verse 55, and this is when Jesus has been arrested shortly before they send him to Pilate, uh, before he's... Uh, crucified on the cross and it says in verse 55 the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death but they did not find any many testified falsely against him but their statements did not agree some stood up and gave a false testimony against him we have heard him say I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made from human hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. 
You see, the case against Jesus was completely built on lies and half-truths. Jesus did say that he would destroy the temple, meaning his physical body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that three days later he would raise from the dead. And they're like, oh no, he's talking about the temple that we have to worship God, that he's going to tear it down and then rebuild it. And so they brought these charges against him. See, too many of us are too worried about what people say about us. Yeah. We're too worried about what people think about us than to just get out there to share our faith, yeah. to preach the word and allow our lives to be examples for others. To allow the Bible to live through our lives. And so we become insecure. Man, I don't know if I, if I share my faith with this, this group of fraternity brothers, what are they going to think of me? If I share my faith with this group of women, what will they think of me? Who am I? I'm just a college student. How in the world can I share my faith with a professional or a married couple? How, what in the world are they going to want to see in my life that's worth imitating? I'll tell you that it's your relationship with God yeah. and the Holy Spirit in your heart. That's right. We can't be intimidated. We can't be insecure about our lives. We have to trust the Holy Spirit when we feel the urge to share our faith with people. Uh, see, often uh, told that, uh, um, well, uh, well, let me just back up. Uh, basically, when I got baptized, uh, I remember I told you I moved in from a friend from high school. And so I changed my life. And I said, look, if we're going to live together, I can't have you doing this in the house. I can't have you doing this in the house. Uh, you know, because I, 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 I'm, I'm different. I need to, we need to live differently. I don't want to be a part of it. And so if I need to get into a place, let me know and we'll make that happen. Uh, and he said, no, 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 but he continued to live these ways, and there was constant opposition between our relationship. Uh, he wanted to live this sinful life still, and I, I, I had given it up. And so he started talking to people back home uh, at our high school. And one day, my little sister, who was still in the high school we went to, came home crying. And she's talking to my mom, and, and she's just in tears, and she's like, I just heard this news about Joe. And so my mom calls me up on the phone, and she's like, crying herself. She's like, I don't want to believe it. But everybody in your school thinks you're homosexual. <laughs> and I don't know what to think because you used to bring women home. Wow. But now every time you come home, you're just bringing guys with you. <laughs> your friends. Wow. Wow. And I was pretty livid at the time. I was like, Mom, what in the heck is wrong with you? <laughs> Why would you believe such a thing? You're the one that raised me. And so I had to help her understand that I would no longer live that way where I was just a womanizer, but that these were true friends, men that called me higher, men that I could call higher. And so we're able to go and, and, and build incredible manly, godly relationships. Amen. Uh, but, but it was crazy. If I had let that get me down, if I had let that really affect me, uh, where would I be today? If I had let that rob my faith, where would I be today? Right. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. And the third area I believe that we need to imitate in Jesus' life and embrace suffering is by sacrificing our comforts. Right. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 18, we pick up here along the way and there's a couple of guys that come to Jesus that want to follow him. It says in verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dents, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus says, I have no home. I got no stuff, man. I move around from place to place. I don't live comfortably. I've given all that up. I didn't come to live for comfort. I came to preach the word. And I came to call people to follow me. If you follow me right now, you'll be, uh, you'll be deciding to give up those comforts yourself. I don't think you know what you're asking for. You see, three years ago when Amelia and I uh, moved away to, to Boston... Uh, I was very comfortable here in Gainesville. Great career, plenty of money, lots of stuff. I like to work with my hands, I like to build things. And uh, so I had tons of tools, 
like a garage full of power tools. Uh, and so, you know, the call was to continue to train for the ministry. And, and in order to do that, God called us to Boston. And so I'm like, well, you know, I looked at some places up north and they're a lot more expensive and they're a lot smaller. Uh, and so I got to get rid of some stuff. So I'm looking around and I'm like, all right, well, a lot of this is, can go. I don't need it on a daily basis. I'm definitely not going to need it up there. And so I lo sold a lot of my belongings to be able to be mo able to move for the gospel. And it's kind of ironic. Uh, 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 Marcel, when he was here, shared that, uh, you know, we left Gainesville with a 26-foot Penske truck. <laughs> packed full. Slammed full of junk. Uh, and, you know, we got there and, and, and moved in. And we moved uh, another time. We got rid of some more stuff. But we moved to a smaller place in Boston. And then we moved to New York. And if you've ever been to New York, you know... Play, I see a hand back there. Uh, places are very, very small. Yeah. We had like a room that was literally everything. It was our living room, our dining room, our kitchen, everything. And it's just a box. And then we had two small little bedrooms off the side of it. And I'm like, our couch is not going to fit in here. <laughs> this is not going to fit here. That's not. And so I was like, man, it's time to downsize again. So we sold a lot more things to move to New York. And on the move down here, everything was packed into a 16-foot Penske <laughs> truck. Uh, I got a couple more feet to cut off my truck to be able to be mobile for the gospel. And God will continue to help me pair uh, my life out a little bit. Uh, but the, the fact is that we need to sacrifice comforts for the gospel. Amen. God always calls us, as we follow Jesus, to give up things that we want to hold on to for our own comfort. We see another guy here in verse 21. It says... Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. You see, this sounds kind of cruel, yeah. kind of harsh. But most scholars believe that his father had not died yet. That he simply is saying, well, let me just wait until my father passes away so I can have the inheritance. Wow. Then I can, I can be full time. I can support myself in the ministry. I can be comfortable. Jesus said, if you wait for that, you'll never make it. Wow. Because you desire comfort more than the gospel. Wow. You'll never make it. So we have to make the decision to sacrifice our comforts when God calls us to. Uh, at the end of the sermon today, we're going to listen to a song. And uh, hopefully you guys can sing along. It's in the song books as well. Uh, but it's called Follow Me. It's all about Jesus and how uh, basically we make uh, excuses in our lives. But when we compare it to Jesus and his life, our excuses pale in comparison. But there's a line in this song that, that just convicts my heart every time. And the song says, If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. You see, Jesus calls us to give up everything for him. It's interesting because I think a lot of times that our, our heart is tested when, when trials come in our life, when, when maybe finances are, are tight. Maybe our schedules are pretty tight. And God's calling us to give up more of our time and our energy. Maybe, our, our, like I said, our finances are tight and we have to make a decision whether we're going to eat out one day or give our contribution. So remember, God calls us to give up everything. You know, it's interesting throughout the Bible... Uh, God calls us to give of our first fruits. To give to Him first before anything else. Right. And, and the interesting part about that, about first fruits, is you always have them. There's always first fruits. You might not have a ninth fruit, or a tenth fruit, or an eleventh fruit, but the first one is always there. Yeah. I have so many experiences through life where you know, I've been like, you know what? Here's my first fruit. I know that it's going to run out by the time my bills get here or by the time my needs get here. But let me step on in faith and trust the scriptures and, and, and trust that God's going to take care of me. And then God always produces some miracle that, that helps me understand and grow my faith. Yeah. So my faith goes from here to here just because I decided to step out on faith. And then there's another time where I step out on faith and I'm like, all right, God, you did it last time, but I don't know about this time. And I step out on faith again and, and God, again, encourages my soul and helps me grow in my faith and what I'm willing to give up for him. 
And it's incredible. It, it blows my mind. Literally, the last time, uh, you know, we, we do special missions once a year. We take up a big collection. Uh, and, and we raise money to help support churches all around the world. And to plant churches all around the world. And it can be challenging because we're called to sacrifice. We're called to fundraise. We spend a lot of hours uh, fundraising. And, uh, you know, my wife and I just said, you know what, let's just, let's just give it all. We're, you know, the region as a whole is short of its goal. We're just going to sacrifice and see what happens. And, and literally, uh, we did so. And three weeks later, I was going through some drawers and I found an envelope that came in the mail, obviously. But I saw the date on it and it had been there for at least a month. But somehow it got stuck in the drawer. I was opening the mail right away. I don't know how this happened. But I opened this and it, it looks like a check. And I'm like studying. I'm like, no, I don't think this is a check. This is like $750. And I'm like, this, this makes no sense. And I look at it and I'm like, no, this looks like a legit check. It's got seals on it and uh, whatever you call those little emblems and stuff. And I flipped it up and you have the description of what it is. And it says, um, refund for canceled auto insurance policy. A year earlier, we had sold our car to move to New York, and all of a sudden we're getting a $750 refund check uh, for our canceled policy. I'm like, okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure this doesn't exist, but God created it so that he can incur it. Uh, but it, it's incredible. You see, anyone who wants to follow Jesus must be willing to suffer Jesus in his, follow Jesus in his suffering. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. And we'll get into our second point here. Don't worry, the second points are a little shorter than the first one. In Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start in verse 24. Okay. We all want to follow Jesus to heaven. Yes. We've got to be willing to follow Jesus in his suffering. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Point number two is follow Jesus to the cross. Jesus says here to take up your cross and follow him. You see, this wouldn't have been anything confusing to the people of Jesus' day. Nope. The cross literally stood for death. The cross stood for execution. It'd be like me saying, you know, uh, everybody, we're going to do an activity here. Go ahead and pick up your noose that's next to you. We're going to go out to this tree here and we're going to do something fun. Whoa. Come follow me. Yep. A little more real example there. Yeah. Everybody understood the cross was for criminals. Wow. It's where they put people to death that had, had uh, done something wrong. But Jesus says to pick up yours and to follow me. Are you willing to do that? He talks about putting yourself to death. What does that mean? He's talking about our old lives. Our life of sinful nature. He says put it to death. Put it to death every day because you don't want to become that person again. Turn to Romans chapter 6. You see, I shared a couple weeks ago pretty candidly about my life and my past. And I know that I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be the man that uh, is without God in my life because he caused a trail of destruction behind him for many people that loved him. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 1, we understand it says, or Paul's talking here about, uh, about we have grace that covers our sin. That we're not bound to the Mosaic law anymore. And so he, he starts off here and he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. He said, we are those who have died to sin. How, then, can we live in it any longer? Amen. Or don't you know that those of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ 
was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Wow. You see, Jesus says, take up your cross, put your old life to death, your sinful nature to death. You got to put that sinful man to death. You got to put that old person you were, ladies, to death each and every day. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus says. You see, we all want the good stuff again, but do we, are we willing to suffer? See, Jesus suffered many things through his entire life, and it all ended, it all ended on the cross for us. See, who needs to be on Joe Mack's cross? See, I need to be on my own cross every day, willing to suffer, willing to endure. Who needs to be on Frank's cross? Frank Bogle needs to be on Frank's cross. Who needs to be on Kathy's cross? Kathy needs to be on her own cross. We each need to be willing to suffer on our cross and deny ourselves every day. Too many of us want Jesus. Jesus, can you be on my cross too? We understand that Jesus certainly died on the cross to atone for our sins. Uh, we know Romans 3.23 talks about it. Uh, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. And that we're all sanctified through His grace. Amen. But Jesus called us each to take up our own. To take up our own cross. Amen. And Jesus was willing to endure it. Come on, bro. Some of us, we want to be on the cross. But we want to get off. This is hard. Uh, I'm so tired. I'm just going to get down for a little bit. Wow. I've been working so hard. I've been going, going, and going. I just need a little break. I just need a little bit of time of self-indulgence. A little bit of time to take care of me and what I really want. Can somebody hang on my cross for a little bit? Just imagine if Jesus had that same heart. He's on the cross and they're, they're mocking him. And he's atoning for our sins. He's taking on all of our sins. And all of a sudden he says, you know what? This is hard. They're kind of taunting me to come down. I'm just going to come off. Wow. Angels, go ahead and destroy them all. Wow. Wow. I don't really want to suffer anymore. Wow. No more atonement for our sins. No more opportunity for a relationship with God the Father. You know what? You better live it up in life right now because when you die, straight to hell with all of you. Wow. And we have this heart that we just want to get off our own cross. We're not willing to endure like Jesus did. See, anyone who wants to follow Jesus must follow him and take up their cross. We're going to pick up in verse 5 here for our final point. In verse 5 it says, For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. Yeah. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin may be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Skip down to verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, point number three is follow Jesus to heaven. This is certainly what we all desire. We all desire to go to heaven, to be with the Father, to follow Jesus right there. You have to be willing, though, to suffer like Jesus suffered. You have to be willing to embrace the challenges so that you can learn and be trained to be obedient to God. You have to be willing to take up your cross and stay on it until Jesus says, It is finished for you. Just like he said it was finished for him. And then he'll say, Guys, follow me to heaven. And we all long to learn the words that Jesus talks about. Uh, just write this one down. Matthew 25, verse 21. It's the parable of the talents. But to the ones who are faithful, Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servants. 
You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Come follow me to heaven and to God be the glory. Yeah.